Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your host, Brandon Hall and Thomas Castelli here. And today, this is this is episode number three of a four-part series on the real estate professional status. And what we're going to be discussing is the myths and strategies behind the real estate professional status. Uh, because if you've been tuning in to the last two episodes, you know that it is one of the most litigated parts of the task code. And for good reason, people really, really, really want to take their rental losses against their active or ordinary income or non-passive income, just to classify it there. Uh, so we do want to set the record straight. This is episode number three of four, and we're going to be demystifying and providing some strategies on how you can actually qualify as a real estate professional. And and, and also, you know, you, you if you've listened to the prior two episodes, if you haven't, you should. But if you've listened to the prior two episodes, you know that we're really big on telling people what they need to hear to win IRS audits, not what they want to hear to make their life easier. Everybody wants to hear that education hours count, that research hours count, that investor time counts, that going to conferences counts. None of that time counts. So we're going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And that's also what part of the myths that we're going to go over are. So the myths are things that we've heard other practitioners telling their clients or education gurus telling their, their people. Um, and, and, and typically it's what you want to hear because they're trying to sell you something, right? Not what you need to hear. So we're going to go over that. So if you want to kick us off with myth number one, I already harped on this for like, <laughs> I had like a five minute soap off. <laughs> so <laughs> for one of those prior episodes, so I'll let you take the first one. <laughs> all right. All right. So the first myth is that, is that you can spend 500 hours in material participation and then 250 hours of anything else in order to hit the real estate professional status. And remember, uh, to get the real estate professional status, you have to have at least 750 hours in a real property trader business, and it must represent more than half your total working time. So what some people think is if they just do 500 hours of material participation, they could spend 250 hours doing whatever, listening to this podcast, other education, seminars, conferences, doing research, you know, just browsing properties on Zillow or Trulia or, or LoopNet or just investor level activities, just reviewing financial statements and things of that nature. And, and that's just not the case. 500 hours of material, uh, the material, let me back that up. Material participation is one and the same. So you need to have 750 hours of material participation. It's not, mm -hmm. and again, I repeat, it is not 500 hours and then 250 hours of whatever you want. It has to be 750 hours of material participation. Material participation. Yeah, yeah, and, and and that's exactly where where everybody gets confused because they think that the so the material participation test that we covered on last episode, it's 500 hours, um, substantially all of your participation, or 100 hours and more than anyone else. So what people do is they they think that if I hit the 500 hour material participation test, I am materially participating. It's then the 250 hours that I, that I also need to hit a total of 750 for real estate professional status. Those 250 can be anything. We've heard that they could be investor level hours. We've heard that they could be education and research hours. Like, like Tom was saying, listening to podcasts, going to conferences. Um, the problem with that is that to qualify as a real estate professional, you need to spend 750 personal service hours in a real property trader business in which you materially participate. You have to, every hour that you count towards the 750 hour test is a material participation hour. So material participation hours, real estate professional status hours, they're the exact same. They're one and the same. People that tell you otherwise, ask for a citation, ask for a citation because they don't exist. They're not gonna be able to give you one because it doesn't exist. So that's why it's a myth. All right, I'm going to take myth number two. Material participation hours and real estate professional status hours are different in character. So literally what we were just saying a rep hour and a material participation hour, they're one and the same. They're synonymous. Um, this is because the two statutory tests for real estate professional status very clearly call out the fact that you have to spend time in a real property trader business in which you materially participate. All right. So I'll, I'll go with number three here. Number three is if I hit 100 hours and more than anybody else that I am golden. And, you know, this might be true if you're just running, you know, a real property trader business, if, excuse me, this might be true if you're running a real property trader business, like maybe you're an agent or maybe you're a flipper outside of just being a landlord. However, remember, you need to hit at least 750 hours. So it, just because you spent 100 hours and, you know, no one else spent more than you doesn't mean you automatically qualify. You still have to hit that 750 hours to qualify as a real estate professional. So just remember, 
you, you, in order to qualify as a real estate professional, you're spending at least 750 hours and more than half your total working time as a real estate professional. If you spend less than that, then you're not going to qualify, period. Uh, the fourth myth that we want to cover is that you can invest out of state, manage your property manager, and still qualify as a real estate professional. Basically that your, your management of your property manager hours count towards real estate professional status. And that's a myth because typically, typically, well, there's one caveat to this, but typically when you manage or supervise your property manager, it's not a material participation hour because what is a material participation hour? It's an hour that's integral to the operations of the rental. Uh, meaning that you, you are participating on a day-to-day -day basis. Your rents would not collect rents. You would, or your rentals would not collect rents. Your rentals would not be able to pay bills. They would fall apart if you weren't doing the hours. Supervising a property manager is not going to get you there. It's not going to get you there because the property manager is doing all of that. So the problem is, he, here, here's the problem. When, when I invest out of state, I've got five rentals and all five rentals have property managers on them. I'm on the phone with them on an ongoing basis I'm making sure that the rentals are good to go, that we're collecting rents, any problems, you know, we're coordinating, but managing the property manager is not going to count. They're doing all the, the actual work. They're doing all the material participation. You're not, you're an investor. So that's why managing property managers is not going to work. The tax court's not going to allow it. The caveat is if you have like 20, 30, 40 properties, and this is a either significant part of your day, not week, but day. Like you, you have to daily manage this or even better if you've quit your job, retired or, or whatever, and you're doing this full time and you're just coordinating between the 50 property managers you have. Cool. That's fine. You're, you're running a real property trader business. That's an operation, real property trader business at that point, right? Real property operation, real property management. Uh, even though you're not the one that's going down there, swinging the hammer, collecting the rents, you're still good. But having my, my wife, you know, I work, I, I run the CPA firm, having my wife, you know, call our out of state property manager for our five rentals once a week is not going to, it's not going to be significant. It's not going to be material participation. Absolutely. Absolutely. You need to have a sizable operation for that, yeah. uh, for that to actually rise to that level of, of, of needing to happen. Um, so now we're, we're moving on to myth number five, and we we harped on this on the last episode for everybody who tuned into that one. Again, if you didn't tune in, you should go listen to that one before you listen to this one. Um, the education and research hours count as reps hours, as real estate professional hours. They do not. Okay, there's we had three tax court cases we discussed in the last episode that that confirmed that education hours do not count. Okay, uh, people want to hear that. They do want to hear. It. You want to know why? Because you can listen to podcasts like this all day. All day long, and just so easy. Hours. Like, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything, right? Just listen to the podcast. You know, while you're in your car, while you're laying down, whatever you're doing. Um, but it's just simply not the case because uh, the task courts and the IRS they 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 believe that it's not material to your business, and uh, that's that's uh, it's just like like I said, there's three task court cases that confirm this, and that's 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 end of story. Okay, it's end of story. And if anybody tells you, if any tax advisors tell you or any gurus out there tell you that it does count, then you need to go speak. Oh, I mean, then <laughs> ask for a citation. I always tell people just ask for a citation, you know, because, because yeah. if somebody can tell you something, then, then they should be able to back it up and we can back it up. We've got three tax court cases that we covered last episode that back it up. Uh, but people that say education and research time counts, um, as far as I'm aware, they can't back it up because I, I'm not aware of a citation that, that, supports that, that notion. And, and I think it's just important for real estate investors to know that they can ask their professionals for citations that you, you should be able, it's just like anybody else, like a quality inspection. You, you should be able to, to have that conversation with somebody. And it, cause here's the downside. Here's the downside. You don't ask, you take their word for it. They've told you what you want to hear, right? Oh man, it's super easy. Well, how easy is that education? Oh, it's so easy. I can qualify as a real estate professional and do freaking nothing. That's great. And then you get audited and then you lose and then you're pissed and then you got to go blame somebody. But guess what? You're the one to blame because you didn't protect yourself. You know, I'm, yeah, you can blame the CPA. You trust the professional. I get that. But look, you're a business owner. If you're investing in real estate. You're a business owner. You need to protect yourself. You need to protect your investment. So at the end of the day, you can blame whoever you want. You can sue whoever you want, but you're the one that's really at fault because you let yourself fall victim to, to listening to people tell you what you want to hear, not what you need 
to hear. Education and research time does not count. We've heard, we've heard that, uh, that people will say, so people come talk to us, like we said, and we, we talked to a lot of landlords, come talk to us and they'll go talk to other people. Then they'll say, well, I was told that CPAs interpret things differently, or I was told that, um, that it's a different mindset or something like that. And the, the, the thing here though, is that, that CPAs interpret the code differently, uh, not because there's different interpretations, at least as it pertains to real estate professional status, but because they're not fully aware of all the tax court cases. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not that, they're, that, that there's another way to do it, because real estate professional status, like we were saying in our prior episodes, it's relatively black and white. And it's relatively black and white because it's so heavily litigated. We have tons of tax court cases to look at uh, to help us make decisions. So it's not that black and white. Don't, don't fall victim, again, to the whole tell me what I want to hear thing, which is, oh, CPAs interpret it differently. And I'll take the position that education research hours count. You're going to lose. Uh, after we wrote that 12,000 word guide, middle of uh, 2020, we started helping with real estate professional audits. Guess what people lose on? Education research hours. Almost every single time. It's crazy. The IRS auditor will literally throw in there, research time does not count. Here are all the citations. You want to challenge me? We're going to tax court. So don't, don't book the education research time. Doesn't count. All right, myth number six. Hitting real estate professional status is easy. Hopefully, if you've listened to episode one and two, and now you're on episode number three, this episode, you've realized hitting real estate professional status is not easy. And anybody selling it to you as easy is uh, full of you know what. So you, you should be asking for citations and really understanding what you're getting into. This is a heavily litigated area of the tax code. You need to make sure that you're crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And just remember that real estate professional status is not a loophole. It's not a loophole. Short-term rentals is a loophole. Real estate professional status is not a loophole because section 469 was implemented in 1986 to stop the loophole. The loophole before 1986 was I'm a rich person earning a lot of income and I can plow my money into real estate. I can accelerate the depreciation and I can offset my income. That was the loophole before 1986. 1986 came, they added section 469, the passive activity loss rules. And that said, all rentals are by default passive. And now we created two buckets of income, passive income and non-passive income. And now rentals were stuck in the passive bucket while our W-2 income and our business income and our dividends and interest and everything else was in the non-passive bucket. So now all of a sudden, we couldn't use rental losses to offset all that income. So it stopped the loophole, it basically stopped the tax shelter. Real estate professional status was later added in 1994 to help people who were full-time involved in real estate and couldn't use their rental losses to offset their development income. So real estate professional status, not a loophole. <laughs> it, it, and, and, and when you think about it like that, you realize, you, you start to understand why it's so heavily litigated because people think it's a lo loophole and they treat it as such, but it's not a loophole. So... We move on to myth number seven. I think this one's pretty clear, pretty easy, okay? Reps hours do not carry over year to year. This is an annual test. So if you, what you did last year in 2020, right, does not matter for 2021 for the real estate professional status, unless you're looking at, you know, one of those tests where it takes into account, you know, the last three years or the last, you know, five or the last 10 years, but at that point, you're not counting hours. It's not an hourly counting test. It's whether you qualified in prior years. So anyway, the point is, that's for material participation, actually. I'm sorry. We maybe cut that part out. But the point is, the bottom line is very clearly, real estate professional status hours do not carry over year to year. You have to qualify for a real estate professional each year in order to qualify as a real estate professional. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The other thing too, so sorry, I, I know that we don't actually have myth number eight here on our, uh, on our podcast sheet, but I want to go ahead and, and throw a myth number eight out because you mentioned it in a prior episode. And I was like, we need to talk about that. If I, if I, let's say, let's, let's go back in time. Let's say it's 2020. And let's say that I buy a rental in November of 2020, but I'm not a real estate professional in 2020. Uh, let's say that I get talked into doing a cost segregation study on that rental. So a cost segregation study accelerates the depreciation. It's going to create a big tax loss for me, uh, which is good in most cases. <clears throat> but in 2020, if I'm not a real estate professional, that tax loss is passive. So I've got a passive loss. Now, let's also assume I don't have any other passive income to offset that passive loss. So now it's a suspended passive loss. 
And let's say in 2021, I qualify as a real estate professional and I've got this suspended passive loss on the books. Maybe it's like $40,000. I cannot use that suspended passive loss in 2021 simply by qualifying as a real estate professional. So qualifying as a real estate professional, myth number eight, qualifying as a real estate professional does not unlock previously suspended passive losses. Because the way that that's treated, those, those passive losses, they're treated as a former passive activity, IRC section 469F, former passive activity. And it remains suspended. That passive loss remains suspended even though the rental is now non-passive. So even though you've recharacterized it, you've moved it out of that passive bucket into the non-passive bucket, the loss that was previously created is treated as a former passive activity loss. It's still suspended. It can only offset passive income from your other passive activities, or it can offset the non-passive income that that one specific rental generates. So if I have a rental property that is now non-passive, and then it happens to generate positive taxable income, which is hard to do with rental real estate, even with great performing rental real estate because of depreciation, then I can tap into that suspended passive loss, even though the rental income is now non-passive because that one specific property had prior suspended passive losses, I can tap into it. Uh, but it's just important to know that simply qualifying as a real estate professional will not unlock the suspended passive loss. We had a, we had a cost seg firm, I'm not going to name them because they're relatively large cost seg firm. Uh, one of the VPs tell one of the folks in my course. So I run a tax course once a quarter and told one of the folks in my tax course that qualifying, they, they should do the cost seg now. This was into 2020. They should do the cost seg now because in 2021, when they qualify as a real estate professional, they can unlock the suspended passive loss. And I almost lost my mind. It's like, how, how, do these, <laughs> how are these cost seg folks telling people this, man? And that was just one instance. I love the cost seg, the cost seg community. They're, they're, they're really great. But, uh, but you just got to be careful. You got to be really careful. This person was credentialed. So you got to be careful who you take advice from. You just got to be really careful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now that we kind of demystified some of the myths that are out there among, uh, among, you know, in, in about the real estate professional status. Let's look at some strategies you can use to actually qualify as a real estate professional. Let's, let's get down to the good stuff, if you will. All right. Strategy number one, we see this a lot. Um, and this is a great way. This is a great way to utilize the real estate professional status and to achieve it. So that is have one spouse qualify as a real estate professional, because once one spouse qualifies as a real estate professional, uh, because if you're married, um, you're filing jointly. Now both spouses are qualified as a real estate professional. And, you know, the spouse that is the real estate professional can use the losses generated from the rental real estate against the other spouse who's, you know, maybe working an active W-2 or business um, income, right? Um, so this, the way this would work is one spouse would qualify for, as a real estate professional completely on their own. All right. So that means you're hitting the one spouse is hitting the 750 hours and more of half their total working time by themselves independently without the other spouse. You know, as we spoke about in other episodes that if that does occur, um, then the second spouse can combine their hours for material participation. Um, so the, that, that, that is the one strategy. Now there's some do's and don'ts here. Okay. Um, do not, do not send emails or communicate on behalf of the other spouse or, or, or try to frame the other spouse as the real estate professional, when you are indeed doing all the work. So for example, if I were married, which I'm not, if I were married um, and my wife were to be a real estate professional and I were to do all of the work on her behalf and just do it all in, under her name, that is a big no-no, a big no-no. And, and we see this a lot because typically one spouse is really interested in real estate and the other spouse is not but the spouse that's not interested in real estate is the one that's not working or has the ability to qualify as a real estate professional. And so then the, the spouse that's super interested in real estate, it's like, oh, well, I'll just send emails on my spouse's behalf and ensure, you know, whatever that, that, that might work under audit, but you get to tax court, they start interviewing people. They start putting people on the stand. It's going to unravel really quickly. And uh, it's just, you just setting yourself up for failure. So don't, don't, don't do that. Don't lie. Integrity is important. Um, uh, and having credibility is important. Absolutely. Again, so just to summarize this strategy, because it is a big one. Um, if one spouse can qualify as a real estate professional, then both spouses 
you know, in theory, we'll get the benefits of it. Not in theory, in reality, we'll get the benefits of the real estate professional status. If you file a joint tax return, this does not work. If you file a, uh, my, a married filed separately return. So also known as MFS for all those people out there who care about that type of stuff. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right. So strategy number two, time your real estate professional status election, make sure that you can claim the losses. So literally what we were just talking about with myth number eight, maybe I don't take a cost segregation study in that first year where my rentals losses are going to be passive. Maybe I wait until a year where I know I can qualify as a real estate professional. And then I do a retroactive cost segregation study. Yes, you can do that. You can file form 3115 with a 481A adjustment. And essentially what you do is you, you say, oops, I'm going to reclassify all of the components within this building uh, to their appropriate class lives. And then I'm going to be able to take all the depreciation that I've missed, including bonus depreciation. Um, and you can do that with the timing. So maybe, maybe I'm buying property in 2020 and we're, we're, we're recording this in 2021, but you know, 2020 is still somewhat relevant. So maybe I bought some property in 2020. Maybe I'm going to buy more property in 2021, but I'm working a full-time job and I'm not going to be able to qualify as a real estate professional. My spouse is not interested and I'm going to take strategy number one there, the, the don'ts to heart um, because I listened to the real estate CPA podcast. So thank you very much, Tom. Uh, but so, so, so I bought property in 2020, bought property in 2021, 2022, I quit my job in January, February. So it, it gives me enough time to still exceed, you know, more than half my time in real estate. So quit my job. Now I'm a real estate professional. I'm materially participating in my rental properties. And I bought like five properties between 2020 and 2021. So I, in 2022, when I qualify as a real estate professional, I can retroactively cost segregate the five properties that I bought in 2020 and 2021. And I can claim all the missed depreciation, including bonus depreciation on my 2022 tax returns because it's going to create a non-passive loss because I'm a real estate professional and because I'm materially participating in my rental properties. So time your real estate professional status election. You don't always need to jump in and do cost segregation studies and accelerate your losses. Like I said, we don't want to we don't want to end up with like myth number eight, where you get a bunch of suspended passive losses that we can't do anything with. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, moving on to strategy number three here. Um, the, another strategy you can use to qualify as a real estate professional is running a separate real property trader business. In addition to being a landlord, um, some common ways to do this, you know, uh, again, if we go back to what it takes to qualify 750 hours in a real property trader business in which you mater materially participate and more than half your total working time in a real property trader business. So for example, if you're a flipper, you know, maybe, or a developer, or maybe you're an agent or a broker, um, these are business, these are real property trades or businesses. And if you do these activities on a full-time basis, uh, there's a good chance you're hitting that, that 750 plus more than half your total working time test easily all day long. And that's all well and good. Um, so that gets you there. Yeah. And, and, and remember too, that you can group all of your time together in all the real property trades and businesses. So like Tom was saying, if you're a flipper and a real estate agent, well, you get to count your time flipping and real estate agent brokering together for the purposes of hitting the 750 in more than half your time. Yeah. And you know, that makes it a lot easier to, to, to hit that 750 hour test um, because, you know, these are activities that you're probably doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're, if you're full-time in those activities, so um, that gets that gets you to that 750 hour point, or and more than half your total working time. But as we discussed in previous episodes, that's not all. You know, you you need to also materially participate in your rental activities. Um, so basically, what you can do uh, there from there is because you already hit the 750 hours mark. You you have one of the three material participation tests on your rental properties. You need to do it by getting 500 hours. Uh, doing substantially everything. So if you have no property manager, you're doing most of the work yourself, chances are you'll be able to get that test. And remember, because you hit the 750 hours, that's an easier test to hit on your rental properties themselves. The third test, you spend 100 hours and no one else spends more time than you. And no one else is an individual as is written in the task code, which we also interpret to mean uh, a company or yeah, a corporation essentially. So um, basically at the end of the day, uh, if you work full-time in one of these other real property trades or businesses, easy examples is a flipping or developing or being an agent or a combination thereof, and you can get that 750 hour test and more than half your total working time, it's going to be a lot less of a hurdle you need to get to um, rather than just trying to get that 750 hour mark and more than half your total working time solely on rental real estate. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because we get a lot of questions around, well, if I get my real estate license, can, can I qualify as a, uh, as a real, as a real estate professional and getting your real estate license has nothing to do with it unless you're going to do something like this, right? Like, like getting my real estate license is not going to help me qualify as a real estate professional unless I'm going to go and actually put together buyers and sellers of real estate. So unless I'm actually going to go and be a real estate agent, because being a real estate agent counts towards the 750 hour test. So in, to Tom's point, he brought up a great point. I can be a real estate agent and let's say that I do it for 700 hours. And then I self-manage my one rental property for 50 hours. Well, I'm going to hit the substantially all test on that, on that property because I'm self-managing it. I'm doing all the work myself. So my participation is substantially all the participation. Therefore I'm, I'm materially participating and maybe it took me 50 hours. So between spending 700 hours being a real estate agent for third parties and spending 50 hours managing my own rental, I'm a real estate professional because I hit the 750 hour test and more than half my time. And I also materially participated in my rental. Where people fall into a trap though is when I spend all of my time being a real estate agent and I have property managers on my rental activities. So I'm a if I spend 2000 hours being a real estate agent during the year, I'm a real estate professional. I, I hit the 750 hour test and more than half my time. But if I have property managers managing all of my rentals, then they're all still passive, right? I still lose. I have to also materially participate in my rentals. So if your rentals, th this is a strategy because if your rentals, if you have a small portfolio, your rentals themselves will probably not get you to 750 total hours in real property trades or businesses in which you materially participate. So the strategy is find a different way to drive towards that time. Be a real estate agent, be a flipper, be a wholesaler, build property, develop property, manage property, be a property manager. You know, find a different business that will help you get towards that seven, get closer to that 750 hour test if you have a small portfolio, because typically the small portfolio, you're not gonna be able to get there on the portfolio itself, on the portfolio itself. Absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so the next strategy is to buy local and, uh, and hit, hit your real estate professional status on local properties. And then, uh, and then the next strategy is to make a grouping election. So well, actually that might be the, yeah, that is the next strategy, make a grouping election. Um, so the way that this works is like, if you're investing out of state, or, or you're, you're investing in syndications. Maybe you put $100,000 into a syndication. And again, they're going to pass back. They're going to do a cost seg study. They're going to pass back a big tax loss for you. Maybe, probably $90,000, $92,000. So I put hundred k into a syndicate, $92,000 back. Well, it's passive. It's stuck in the passive bucket. I can't, I can't move that into the... I can't materially participate in the syndication itself. I'm a limited partner. There's no way. It's... it's, it's, uh, it's factually, factually impossible to do. So what I do instead is I buy property locally and I, I qualify as a real estate professional on my local property. So maybe I buy two, three, four properties local to me within a 10 minute drive, 20 minute drive. Maybe they require a lot of rehab work and I can finish the rehab work and get it rented out, rent, rented out by the end of the year. So if I can do that, I can meet my real estate professional status tests, 750 more than half of my time and my material participation steps, uh, my, my material participation tests all in one fell swoop. So I buy properties locally. I rehab them. I spend, I get to count all my time spent on the rehab as long as it's rented out by the end of the year. Uh, it'll count as rental activity. So now I'm spending material participation time in a rental activity. And, uh, and, and then I can make the nine election, which is the next strategy. So I guess I'll just jump into that. The next strategy is to make the nine election to group all of your rental activities together as one. Because when I group all my rental activities together as one, I have to materially participate in the entire group across the entire portfolio. If I don't do that, I have to show that I materially participated in each individual activity in order to make it non-passive. Otherwise it's all passive, right? So, so if I don't make the, let's say I have a property and I spend 750 hours managing the property, maybe it's a 10 unit apartment complex, 750 hours managing the property, doing rehab work, I'm doing it all myself. So I've got that property. Well, that's non-passive because I spent 750 hours. So I qualify as a real estate professional and let's just assume I spent more than half my time. 
Uh, and I also spent 500 hours managing that property. So I automatically materially participate as well. So I'm a real estate professional and I materially participate on that one property. Then I go and I make a hundred thousand dollar investment to a syndicate and they pass back a $92,000 loss. I might think falsely that because I'm a real estate professional and because I materially participated in that one property, that my syndicate investment is also non-passive, but that's not true. And the IRS will get you on that every single time uh, under audit. <clears throat> they're they're going to look for the nine election, uh, Treasury Reg section 1469-9G. They're going to look to see that you made that election. If you did not, they're going to say, sorry, that syndication investment is, is still passive because you did not materially participate in the syndication investment. You did materially participate in your 10 unit property and you hit the 750 hour test. So you're a real estate professional, you materially participated there, but you didn't materially participate in the syndication investment. You're a passive partner, you're an LP. You don't make management decisions. You don't have voting rights and you don't participate in the day to day. No way that you materially participated there. You didn't make the nine election to group all your rental activities together as one. So unfortunately that $92,000 loss is passive. So the next strategy here is to make the nine election. Making the nine election aggregates all of your real, your rental real estate interests into one activity. So I just have to materially participate in the entire group. So same scenario, I materially participate in my 10 unit property. Then I make the nine election to aggregate my limited partnership interest in with my 10 unit property. Now I have one rental activity and I've, I've hit the 500 hour test. So I materially participate. I materially participate in every single sub activity underneath that one rental activity. Um, so now that $92,000 loss is non-passive and uh, it's just a really critical thing to, to do. People will tell you, oh, the nine election is so risky. It's not. People that tell you that typically don't understand how the former passive activity rules work. Not risky. Uh, you should 100% do it if you're going to, if you have a large portfolio and you're trying to materially participate. Actually, I should say you should 97% do it. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean... <laughs> You know, here's the reason why, and here's why, okay? And the reason why you want to do this is it's this simple. So if you have former suspended passive losses from prior years, the myth out there from a lot of CPAs is that if you if you elect this Dash 9 election, you cannot unlock those losses. But that's not true, necessarily. So if you go ahead and you sell a property, you have a massive capital gain, um, you can, that loss, the, 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 the former passive loss will be unlocked to the extent of the gain on sale of the property. So they do, they can and they will be used under those types of circumstances. Um, so it's not all, is not all loss. And that's really the primary reason why people, other CPAs is tend to tend yeah. to say that it's, it, it doesn't make sense, but that's just wrong. And we went through all this stuff uh, of why, you know, CP, uh, other practitioners maybe don't understand all of the rules that are related to this. Uh, so at the end of the day, like Brendan said, like 90, 97% of time, I'm sure you could find a few, you know, specific instances where it would not make sense. I just can't possibly think of one off the top of my head today. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in a down market, like where, where you're selling rentals at a loss and you can't claim the loss. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I think then I think at that point, the NOL might come in, but anyway, we're getting to the rabbit holes. We're getting to very specific, maybe situations um, that may or may not uh, actually pan out in reality. Um, so, you know, kind of going on to the sixth, strategy here um this is uh, i know this is brandon's one of brand's favorite ones document 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 oh it's so to lame oh no it's so lame why is that even a strategy well it's not going to be lame when you, if you ever get pulled into an order or task court and you have all your stuff in order all right <laughs> right um so oh, like here, here's the thing right so people uh, you know the time log or a calendar to substantiate the amount of time you spent in your real property trader business and your material participation all of that um, is going to be critical um, in the event of an audit or you know in the event that you ever do make the task court uh, so you do want to have that documented you do want to have uh, just the same way you want to document your receipts when you're deducting expenses you want to have your hours documented you also want it to be you also want to do this on a contemporaneous basis in other words, on a proactive basis, uh, because if it, it, the one thing that is definitely frowned upon um, by the IRS and by task court is logs that were made up um, when you were under audit. And look, I, I could tell you, I track my time for a lot of things and <laughs> trying to remember what I did yesterday is sometimes challenging. Okay. Literally, I'm not even kidding. Sometimes trying to track what I did for certain times yesterday. So imagine, you know, you're trying to go back and do a log for 
you know, one to two to three or four or five years later, how the hell are you going to, I honestly, I, I'm thinking, this is just me thinking <laughs> practically. I, we wait I, till you I, have kids. It gets even worse. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I did an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I, you know, so so the, 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 the point of the matter is documentation is key. You want to keep your logs. Uh, you want to keep a log. You want to keep it on a contemporaneous basis. We recommend typically doing it on a, a, a daily or a weekly basis and make sure you have everything going and everything uh, nice and tight. So that if you are ever audited, you know, three years from now, five years from now, however many years from now, that uh, you, you're thanking your past self uh, for yeah. doing that work and putting yourself in a, in a good position. It's like Comey, right? FBI director takes very copious notes, can remember everything in detail, like down to the minute, years and years and years later. You don't necessarily have to be on that level, but that would certainly help your credibility if you were audited, if you were taken to tax court. And it's all about credibility because the tax court's hearing one side, they're hearing, your, they're hearing your side, they're hearing the IRS's side, and they've got to make a determination on, are you credible? Are you, are you actually telling me the truth? Um, and do the facts align with that? So take really good notes, document, document, document. It's so critically important. Uh, that you get it done. And, and we've been helping with IRS audits on real estate professional status and people lose and they lose because again, they're booking education and research and investor hours, our time and the, the auditor will call it out. But typically the, the auditor is also going to call out, yeah, you made the time log only once we initiated the audit and, and they will, they will make a note of that. And that's not necessarily like, you know, something that is going to hurt you in the audit per se, I mean, it does hurt you in the audit, but it's definitely going to hurt you in tax court because tax court's going to go, well, they're just going to recite that. Well, that's a notch against you because you created the time log only once you're under audit, which was two, three years later. So make sure that you create the time log today. It can be a, it can be a spreadsheet. It can be a Google calendar. We'll drop it in the show notes. So you can drop, you can go click on the link in the show notes, enter your email address. We'll send the time log over to you that we've created for our clients. Recommend that you push it out to Google uh, Sheets so that you can put it on your phone. It's nothing crazy. It's very simple. Date, time, uh, how much time you spent at the property, what property, and what did you do? What are the notes? Just, just to, just to remind yourself. Just getting, getting that good habit. Getting that good habit. Um, so, strategy. The, the next strategy. I'm actually going to make one up uh, again. That's not on our on our list here. So, I'll let you take that last one. Um, the next strategy is. So the very first strategy we said, hey, your non-working spouse can qualify as a real estate professional. But what we forgot to also dive into is the fact that for the purposes of material participation, you can count your spouse's time. So one spouse has to qualify as a real estate professional completely on their own. But for the purposes of material participation, the rental activities, you can count your spouse's time. So example, I work full-time at a CPA firm uh, that I run <clears throat> and my wife has her own side business that she runs, but perhaps I'm able to talk her into getting a real estate license and becoming a real estate agent. Now, remember getting a real estate license in and of itself does not help you qualify as a real estate professional. You have to actually use your license to run, to, to actually be a real estate agent for other people, not for yourself. It has to be other people. So my wife gets a real estate agent license. She goes and she's, she's a real estate agent for other people. And let's just assume that she hates our rental properties. She doesn't, she loves it. But just let's just assume that she hates our rental properties and she doesn't want to deal, deal with it. She doesn't want to spend any time in it. Well, as long as she hits 750 hours being a real estate agent, and as long as she spends more time being a real estate agent than she does running her side business, which is Bonnie's Blooms, by the way, if you want to get your flowers pressed, if you just got married or have a special event, go check out bonniesblooms.com. Also at Bonnie's Blooms on Instagram. There you go. Very proud of what she does. <laughs> Presses flowers. It's amazing. Anyway, so she, <laughs> Tom, when you get married, you can, you can, you can advertise for your spouse too. Man. Yeah. Yeah. She's going to be a real estate professional. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Tom, that's Tom's criteria for marriage. Is that you, uh, are you going to first date? All right. How much do you like real estate? <laughs> One to 10. <laughs> anyway, so my, it's my wife. So, so she goes and she spends at least 750 hours being a real estate agent. She spends more time being a real estate agent than she does at Bonnie's Blooms. And so she qualifies as a real estate professional, but she hates rental properties. She doesn't, but let's assume she does. She hates the rental properties, hates dealing with it. So I'll do all the rental property management. She gets to count my time for material participation purposes managing the rentals. So if I spend 500 hours managing the rentals, we are collectively a real estate professional 
and we've materially participated in our rentals. Our rentals are now non-passive. So spouses get to combine time. Maybe she spends 100 hours managing the rentals and I spend 400 hours managing the rentals. Collectively, we've hit 500 hours. Get your spouse involved in managing rentals. All right, and now we're here for the last strategy. The last strategy is, well, what happens if you cannot qualify as a real estate professional? Is there anything else you can possibly do to take losses from rental properties against your non-passive income? And there is one thing you can do, okay? And this is a loophole in the definition. This is definitely a loophole. It's called the short-term rental loophole. And basically, uh, there's an exception. There's an exception. If your property has an average stay of seven days or less, all right, um, then it's not considered a rental property for the section for the purposes of the passive activity rules. And that um, is Treasury Reg Section 1.469-1 Cap T E32 Cap A. Yeah, Anybody I'm looking at it right that? now, but I don't I, I'm looking at the actual tax code and it's uh it's the average period of customer use for such a property seven days or less. So, you know, that's for all your, your if you're, you're, you know, you're rent, you have a short-term rental property, you're listing on Airbnb or VRBO or what have you. Um, if it has an average day of seven days or less, it, you do not need to qualify as a real estate professional. However, however, you do need to prove material, material participation. Okay. Um, and we're going to go back to those three tests we spoke about in the previous podcast episodes. Okay. The three tests are A, first test. Uh, you spend 500 hours on the activity. B, you do substantially everything. Or, so these are all or. Or you do substantially everything. Or C, uh, you spend uh, more than 100 hours and no one else, no other individual spends more than you. Um, so if you hit any one of those tests, then your losses for your short-term rental business, assuming your short-term rental business has an average stay of seven days or less, or your short-term rental property, excuse me, is average stay of seven days or less, then those losses will be non-passive. Now, remember, remember what we said in previous, previous episodes. Your spouse's time can count towards the material participation test. Your, your spouse's time cannot count towards that 750-hour rep, re, uh, real estate professional test, but we're not talking about reps here. You don't need to be a real estate professional to use this strategy. So if you and or your spouse spend 500 hours of material participation, on your short-term rental or rentals, uh, you'll be able to you'll be able to take the losses as non-passive as long as the average stay again is seven days or less. Um, same thing with substantially all. If you and your spouse do substantially everything, boom. Uh, if you do uh, at least hundred hours between you, more than hundred hours between you and your spouse, then you're and no one else, no other individual spends more time than you. Then you're going to qualify and you're going to be able to use the losses from your short-term rental properties against your non-passive income. And just to and just to tie it all together too, uh, you, you did a great job explaining it. That that seven day exception, se it, it is seven days or less, which is what you said. But a lot of people and my, myself included, sometimes I'll be like on a presentation, I'll say less than seven days. But it is seven days or less. If you rent, if your average period of customer use is seven days or less, you do not have a rental activity under Section Four Sixty Nine. And that's important. Words are important when it comes to the tax code because section 469 says all rental activities are passive by default unless you qualify as a real estate professional. Section 469 also says if you don't materially participate in a trader business, then, uh, then it's passive. So if I don't have a rental activity, then I don't have to worry about that first part. All rental activities are by default passive unless you qualify as a real estate professional. I don't have to worry about real estate professional status because I don't have a rental activity because I rent my property seven days or less. So all I have to worry about is material participation. And if you're listening to this episode, um, once it's produced, we're, we're live on Facebook right now. For the people that are live on Facebook, you're gonna have to wait a little bit. But once this is produced and released and you're listening to this episode, I believe that you'll have, uh, next episode is the IRS audits. Uh, which will, which is going to be a, great, a good episode. And in the episode after that, we're going to start our short-term rental series. So we're, we're going to dive into that in two weeks. So stay tuned. Absolutely. So this is a lot of exciting stuff we covered here today on uh, today's episode regarding the myths and strategies to actually qualify as a real estate professional. And perhaps this last one, which you could do if you don't. Um, so is there anything else, Brandon? We should be we should be we should you know be dropping here before we call this one a wrap for today. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I think the last thing is just don't, don't get creative, man. <laughs> this is not, this is not a section of the code that you want to get creative with. I mean, you, you, and, and when I say creative, you know, just pe people get creative with, with real estate professional status, uh, by, by inflating time and logging things that just don't count. Just, just don't do that. And if you're, and if you're concerned about it, we, we've been doing, um, risk analysis studies for people. So, you know, it costs anywhere between 1500 to 2500 bucks. You can hire us to look at your time log to educate you on exactly how this works. And we can tell you like per hour. Yeah, this is a high risk hour. This is a low risk hour. This is medium risk hour. We'll look at your real property trades or businesses. And we'll say here are your real property trades or businesses. These are the ones that count. These are the ones that don't count. Um, we, we've, we've been doing that and people have been excited about that. But, but we've been doing that because we've been going through these audits with people that pull us in the middle of an audit. And, uh, and we realize it's way too late for them. So we're just taking all that and we're saying, why don't we build basically an audit defense file up front and teach you exactly how this works up front. So if you're interested in something like that, reach out to us. You can go to www.therealestatecpa.com uh, and, and check out our services and then fill out a form. Or you can contact us at contact at therealestatecpa.com. Absolutely. And we'll see you on the next episode where, again, we'll be covering the audit side of the real estate professional status and related matters.